Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jack Hathaway, for those of you who I have met, uh, probably I know almost everybody in the room. Uh, so with me tonight is Bob Lindmark, our finance director. Sue Jacobson here is here. He's uh, does the administrative work for the advisory committee as well as is our uh, formal housing director. Uh, Jay Talman, our moderator, is hiding in the back there. He's, he's very shy, so be careful. And Jim Lehan uh, from our board of selectmen is here, as well as Carol Green, our town clerk. I know there's a number of energy committee members here and uh, petitioner for the uh, the, the uh, stretch code article. Um, and I think that's everybody who's an official official. And oh, then we have the advisory board. Brian, I can't pronounce your last name. Pichkowski. Pichkowski. Thank you all for coming. So this will be, as, as you can see, Katie from NCTV is here. This will be video and audio taped. I'm sure they'll run it on NCTV and have it uh, loaded up to YouTube for anybody that wants to watch this in the future. Um, so what my plan is tonight is just kind of rather quickly go through the 17 articles, uh, explain them, kind of give you a, maybe a reason why it's an article and, and what we're trying to do with it. Um, Maybe a couple quick questions as we go along, but I don't want to get bogged down on one, any one particular article until we get through them once. Um, and then after, after we do that, which I, again should be pretty quick, and if you have specific questions about a specific article, we'll go back and, and kind of talk more in, in depth. Um, not intending to have debates about the merits of an article uh, tonight, that's, that's for town meeting. But at the end, if we want to get into kind of a free-flowing conversation about a particular article, that's. Uh, and you know, we'll let that happen at the end of the end of the evening. So, without further ado, I'll go through. Uh, and Todd, my finance guy here. Is, uh, we're, so, Article One is about transfers. We do this at every town meeting. We're, we're correcting some budgets or accounting for some uh, changes in operations that have happened throughout the year. So, we have the list of those. And I'm sorry if I, I have warrants up here as well as uh, copies of this <coughs> presentation. So, if you didn't get those. Uh, to grab those up front. Um, but Todd, can you quickly talk about kind of what we're doing with transfers? Jack, if we turn down the lights, do you get better contrast? I meant to do that, thank you. Is that going to mess you up, Katie? No, we're going to work that out. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the transfers that we're anticipating, uh, we have certified free cash of 90538 That's the end of the year. We have to uh, provide uh, Division of Local Services Department of Revenue with our information as far as what we receive the revenues, our expenses, our essentially our retained earnings or certified free cash is what takes certified. And this year we had 1.5 uh, million certified free cash. So some of that certified free cash we're going to use for transfers. The KP Regional Operating Budget of 129201. We actually um, went to budget last year at the uh, meeting, so we had to provide about a 4% increase for the KP budget. The uh, increase is only 3.244, uh, so therefore we have 129,000 that we can uh, take back from this KP budget that we uh, originally anticipated. And then we have $1,200 coming in from a fire department code violation, which is a special revenue um, account. Uh, those monies will be used for the fire department training. Where those monies are going to be going to, we have town administrator salaries. Uh, need an additional four hours to help that office out with uh, some of the meetings um, that the administrator is going to be doing. We have town salaries. Uh, we have a non-union component, and we've always been giving uh, the step increases on their anniversary dates, which have not coincided with the July 1 date. So to switch everybody to the July 1 date, uh, it's going to cost about $7,000. We're giving monies back to the facilities maintenance department because we had to pull monies out of their budget when we announced the budget for fiscal year 18. So again, um, we originally pulled out 60,000. We're giving back 30,000. Police department salaries, um, we pulled out 29,450. We're giving back the, um, that amount for their salaries, as well as the fire department expenses at $16,008. Showing 17208, which is the $1,200 in the fire department code violation. If there's any questions, please don't uh, hesitate. To stick up your hand and I'll answer them. Uh, the advisory board reserve, we had uh, money come out of that. 
that was to uh, fund some software for our other departments. Um, uh, on the other departments that we have, um, be a little bit more efficient, especially with the licensing and permitting. Uh, so that's going to put the money back into the advisory board reserve. Uh, zoning board expenses, it's to hire a consultant. Uh, Norfolk Public Schools, 67806 That's uh, some money that are going back to the schools, which covered two of the salaries that they had to cut from the uh, previous budget, and then a small capital item for that. And then we're um, also pre-funding our snow and ice a little bit of 25000 all in, $220,939. Those are the transfers. Question? I just have a question. I missed the um, town administrator salaries. That is a transfer because of the increase in salary due to? Uh, we're having four, additional four hours a week to help the, the um, admin attend various meetings, especially with the zoning board, to help out, um, provide information back to the um, by, uh, so it's an administrative position. Yes, it's, it's not an administrative position. Administrative. No, it's not an administrative. No. Okay. And um, just a question in general on the the warrant. The advisory board recommendations aren't listed on this. Is this they did before, <coughs> didn't they? They've updated it on the website, so they are on the website now. Uh, they should be in this packet here. This is just printed on Monday. And then just I didn't highlight it, but on the little boxes on the bottom of those, those are those are mine just kind of very layman's terms explanations of what the what those articles are for as well. Okay. Thank you. Done. Well, we uh, we have no one paid bills. Capital expenditures. So this is items that we purchased that we may have useful only for three years or more in excess of ten thousand um, so dollars. Some of the items include the yeah, information technology expenses, as to purchase some servers um, that we need uh, that need to be replaced. Library facilities maintenance, twelve thousand dollars. As to repair a boiler, um, the town clerk voting machines. I actually asked uh, Carol Green the other day to uh, verify some of the assets that we had on the um, listing and looking at the dates that we actually acquired those voting machines. I was quite astounded. Uh, they, they are quite old though uh, currently. So the uh, town clerk voting machines will get us four new machines, I believe, for the twenty-one thousand eight sixty-nine. <coughs> Police Department vehicles, 100,000, that's two new cruisers. Firemen, fire department vehicle duty truck, it's 190,000, that's for the on duty truck, which would really, uh, contain some hoses and all the life saving equipment um, that's necessary. Uh, DPW, they actually have two dump trucks, both of them are not road worthy. So, um, here in the DPW, uh, 144,100, which is actually down from the 165 that they originally asked for to provide them with the dump truck. Uh, DBW F-250 pickup, 40,300. And then the Norfolk School, uh, we're doing a building study, because um, we have about 40 kids coming in, so we have a lot more, potentially a lot more kids coming into our system. So we are going to be going to do a study on uh, putting expansion on the uh, Freeman Kennedy School. Uh, so that would cover that cost. Those are our capital expenditures. All that money will be coming from the certified free cash. 532-269. Questions? Sorry. <laughs> we have some other questions. We should, um, I think the, for, uh, the, sorry, I didn't interrupt you for one second. I think for Kate's purposes, do we need them to use the mic? Is that, yeah, so. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, can, we can hold, we can pass it on. But um, just for anything for. I guess my, my question is the, um, the trucks, the fire department truck, the police truck, and whatever working DPW trucks are at. Are these amounts net of the um, resale price of the existing trucks we're getting rid of, or are we repurposing the trucks, especially like the police cars and the fire truck? 
Um, are we reselling them and getting some sort of proceeds before purchasing the new one? You know, say the minimum purchase would be limited. Does that include the net amount there? It doesn't. It does not. So it uh, doesn't. We generally sell them off separately. We don't. Uh, uh, once in a while, the DPW will trade in the vehicle, but for, for the most part, um, you know, they, they reach their useful life. So they're, they're in the DPW's case, they, they literally have, you know, they, they welded stop signs to the floorboards. But uh, the police, and the police and fire trucks obviously could be right. Probably repurposed or resold. They are in, in the police department's case, they have a they have a number of vehicles that are the frontline vehicles that the officers go out and do the daily shifts in. Then they have uh, a second level vehicle that uh, are used for going to court or uh, for detail officers who are uh, not on duty officers, but for people who may be going with Verizon to you know do a street uh, detail. And then they, they have a third level vehicle that is just in an emergency that you know if, if for some reason we have to call the entire department in for um, for. You know, a lost child or something. We need to have a vehicle for every officer, um, and those are the ones that are. You know, the newer vehicles are up on the front line, and then they get handed down. So by the time we get to that third level vehicle, there, there again, there's not much value in those. Um, in the old days, we used to hand them down to the assessors and, and other departments that don't need vehicles that can go. You know, respond. Um, but we've gotten away from that a little bit. Tried to use more fuel efficient vehicles. Uh, we have a little Ford Focus for the fire department now. Um, that's really the only other department we buy vehicles for. So, um, so at the end of the day, we're, we're generally sending DPW vehicles to scrap. Um, but if we have a vehicle that is working, we'll, we'll, we do go through the procurement laws, reverse procurement laws, and then we actually auction them off or you know, use Municipid, which is an online site. Um, we auction those off and then the money go back into the general fund. We can't spend the money without kind of meeting appropriation. And um, just going forward, of those those costs of those vehicles, um, do they include the high efficiency or high energy efficiency requirements under the Shark Code if that was approved during town meeting? Or will that, because well, it's not, I'm assuming those numbers go up. Well, a lot of those vehicles are exempt from that. Uh, oh, okay. The public safety vehicles, um, with, uh, you know, with, uh, large DPW trucks would be exempt. Um, the vehicles that would apply to the, the related to being a green community um, are more administrative vehicles. Uh, yeah. If we could use the microphone just for NTTV, I mean, that was a question, I guess, you know. Oh, yeah. So I, I'd like um, to understand better exactly what's in the information technology um, item. We could either talk about that now or the end. And the other thing I'm interested in is the voting machines that you're probably aware there are uh, bills in Massachusetts legislature currently that would um, uh, put in place rank choice voting and also there's likely to be a um, question on the um, November uh, 2018 um, ballot about rank choice voting and um, I'd like to be confident that if we buy new voting machines and we're forced to use rank choice voting or we elect to use it, that the voting machines we buy now would be compatible with rank choice voting. The concept of ranked choice voting, um, I'm fine. So, sorry. Uh, I'm actually not even going to get into the concept of ranked choice voting um, because it, it is a very outside possibility in Massachusetts. Um, I, I, to be able to address the voting machines, uh, my voting machines are from 1995 and 1996. I have some of the oldest machines in the state. Um, the company that uh, that services them, no longer even produces those machines, so when I have to have them repaired, uh, they can scrap parts off of something else. Um, there's only two companies that make voting machines that are certified by, Mass by uh, the Secretary of State's office, um, and we've priced them, you know, we've priced them both, they're both comparable. Um, but there's going to come a time, and it's not going to be long, that something's going to break down, and we're not going to be able to get fixed. 
and with an election, we just can't do that. Um, I, I would assume, I may be incorrectly, that the, the state is aware of the question about ranked choice voting, and um, I would think that the companies that produce these machines probably have the ability to adjust the machines to that because they program the cars to go in them. And the companies that make these machines don't just make them for Madison, Massachusetts, they do make them for other states. Um, so the possibility is there that they're already using them for ranked choice voting in other states. I don't know that for a fact. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't find voting machines. I understand it's the case of why we need them. I'm just um, hoping that before placing an order, an inquiry is made to verify that these machines that we're about to buy would in fact be capable of handling my choice voting. I can certainly ask that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I was just curious, what um, technology do they use? I, I mean, you know, it doesn't find with me that we get new machines. I was just wondering whether those some of the ones where you have a paper ballot. It's still, it's still a paper it's ballot. The same, right? um, being sent through, they're just uh, um, more, newer. Yeah. Okay. Newer, more efficient. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Anything else about machines? Is that replacing all the machines? Yes, I, I currently have four. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and the reason I'm actually the reason I'm actually getting four more, mm -hmm. even though we only have three precincts, I like to have a backup mm -hmm. because that way, if one goes down during an election, I can just put another one directly in, and it also allows for um, as we grow, we're probably going to have to go to four precincts. We're going to have to do re-precincting at some point in time and go to four precincts. Now I don't have to buy another machine. Mm -hmm. I can use that one. So I'm just trying to think ahead a little bit. Yeah. Are you going to keep the old ones? Uh, no, they actually they do have a trade-in value to go back to the company that I'm buying them for. I get, I don't know, it's, it's two thousand dollars. I think it's, it's not a lot, but it's something. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to ask whether you want to talk more about information technology now, or you prefer to handle that at the end. Um, all I can tell you is that we're right. so the request is. So the request is basically the replacement of two servers. Servers typically have a life of about three to four years. We're at a four-year mark for the two servers that we're replacing. So it's just a normal course of business to be replaced. So I'm really looking for more detail about what are the servers being used for exactly. And um, uh, I understand that there's often um, a limited life cycle for equipment thought like that, but I also know that often it in fact can be used very much longer than its nominal life cycle. So the question would be what kind of problems are we encountering that require us to replace it now rather than just now it's a few years old. I think mean, yeah, why don't we I'm glad to hook you up with our IT director. Uh, he's not here tonight. Um, he will be at I believe he will be at Tommy. Uh, if not certainly have an offline conversation. I can tell you, we, we you know, MacGyver stuff, we, we, we try and stretch stuff out as long as we can, um, but we're getting more and more, the technology demands are getting more and more uh, serious and we're, we're trying to keep our equipment, uh, especially the servers, at a, uh, in good shape. Uh, for <laughs> security purposes as well as just for performance. So right. keep that. So I'm, I'm not being critical about no, no. this idea, I just want to understand yeah. So when you're ready, so why don't you take that with you? And if somebody has a question, just hand it to whoever has a question. We'll, we'll stand here with the stand on. <laughs> yeah. The other capital is just a water service vehicle. Um, if you see the rent them, they have like a, um, a blue truck that has every tool in it that they can use. Uh, and uh, so rather than our guys, you know, lot, we have the, the old COA minivan that we use as a, as a vehicle. Um, and it's, you know, it's been retrofitted two or three times and right now it's the water department service vehicle, service van. Um, so we're having, a, we're having basically a, a workshop on wheels that the water department can go out and when they have a water break or we're doing some work, they have all the tools with them and, and, and fix hydrants, etc. And then tag along trailer, it's just a small trailer that uh, Again, has the, the, the other tools that they may need uh, that they'll bring on, on big jobs if they need. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. The Water Enterprise Fund, is that from the town water takers only? 
Correct. So that's that's funded by water revenue. So uh, hookup fees, water certainly water usage fees. So that's not coming out of the general fund. The, the first uh, group of items was from the general fund. This is just from the water takers, uh, the water users. Um, and Todd has the numbers. The general fund has a free cash balance of six hundred eighty-four thousand two sixty-three. After after all our transfers. Yeah. And the water would have the <coughs> retained earnings available of eight hundred twenty-nine thousand nine forty-six. Again, after this expense. After the expense. So Article 4, very near and dear to Mr. Lee and Hart, is a transfer to the stabilization fund. The stabilization fund is our, is our savings account. Uh, it takes a three quarters? Two thirds. Two thirds. Two thirds vote to transfer in or out of the. No, only, only out now. And it's just a majority. Huh. It's a good thing to see. All right. Uh, so a majority vote to go into the stabilization fund, and two thirds vote to come out. Uh, again, that's our, that's our savings account. We have just under $1.5 million in there as of November. 30th, um, and we're obviously going to add two hundred fifty thousand dollars to that. It's very important for us to have that. Obviously, it's our rainy day fund. If uh, if we would need to draw from that for some tra catastrophic events, um, but even more importantly, on a day to day basis, it, that's that's an important factor that the bond rating bond services look at for our bond rating. And that the better bond rating we get, the lower interest rate we get when we borrow. Um, it's just uh, it's a good good business. What's the bond rating? Double A plus. Okay. Thank you. Um, Article five is committee reports. Uh, I know the public safety building committee will have a discussion about uh, they'll give us an update on the public safety project projects um, both at the Sharon Ave, which is the police station, and the Metacomet Regional Dispatch Center, and uh, and then obviously the, the fire department. Transferring the public safety building into a park. That money has already been appropriated. The, the projects are underway. Article six is uh, part of the Municipal Relief Act from a couple of years ago, and uh, we can adopt different sections of the law. Um, so it's a local option. Uh, in this case, what we would be able to do is uh, for any property tax bills that are less than $100 annually, we'd be able to bill them in one bill rather than send them out the traditional four bills. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of makes sense, I think, it, it, both for the person who may have a small parcel that doesn't want to pay four times, um, but certainly from the treasurer's office to be able to just send out one bill rather than <coughs> two and have to process four returns. Uh, I think that one makes sense. Uh, this Question one, about that? Yes, sir. Um, so as you may remember, I've um, been taking advantage of the Unipay feature on uh, uh, the website so that I've never heard that. <laughs> so they can pay bills. And one of the things I very much would like to do is get um, a bill for four quarterly payments and then schedule them all when I get the bill so I don't need to worry about them in the future. And there's been difficulty with that. And um, so I have no objection to this article. I would certainly very much appreciate if. Um, the um, Unipay process got changed so that um, all the four quarterly payments could be scheduled at the time that a citizen receives the bill. Okay. Uh, Dave and I have a very close relationship. <laughs> um, this next article is again by the, uh, proposed by the Treasurer and it's part of the Municipal Relief Act. And it, what it um, process now is uh, we call it good standing. So when when somebody comes in and asks for a permit, these are generally uh, building permits that we're talking about. Um, somebody comes in for a permit, uh, we have a process of going around to all the departments, including the treasurers, to make sure that the applicant is in good standing. Uh, in terms of what the treasurer does, they, they look to see if they have any past due bills. Uh, Prior to this adoption, um, we have to wait until somebody's more than a year past due before we can we can you know flag them, if you will. Um, so somebody could be a year past due on a, on a property tax bill, um, or they could be you know, 364 days short on a on a property tax bill. Apply for a permit, and we wouldn't be able to you know hold them up. So for collection purposes, we think it's more appropriate that if. This, what this would do is change the process that if you're past due at all, we would have the ability to flag you. 
and not issue a permit. Um, the treasurer would have the flexibility that if somebody, you know, we've talked about, especially the advisory board, we've talked about situations where there's a, you know, maybe a home that uh, uh, is, has been inherited, um, they have a septic issue, they need, to, they need to have a pull a septic permit, and get some work done, um, and maybe they're, you know, the parents or whoever had the home before was in a past due situation. The treasurer would have the ability to work with that person either set up a prop, either set up a uh, payment plan, or certainly we're going to get paid taxes when we know that the, when the house closes, so we're going to get paid at that point. So we still have the flexibility to work with people, but um, this would help us in situations, and this kind of the bigger situations where this comes into play is when we have some of the developers. Um, you know, somebody who has a whole you know, they have 14 lots that they're, they're nine months behind in taxes, yet they're still trying to pull more building permits. Um, we would like to be able to manage those, those negotiations a little bit better. Um, the other situation that we've talked about too is, you know, if a small contractor, just a home repair guy comes in and tries to pull a permit on behalf of somebody, uh, and yet that person is nine months behind taxes, the, the small contractor isn't going to know that. Well, they may be working with somebody who, you know, so we're trying to protect the small contractor there and just let them know we can't give you that permit because the person owes nine months of taxes and so they may have to rethink whether or not they want to do business. So those are the two situations that I think of. Um, the treasurer, you know, met with the advisory committee and, and you know, certainly has situations that deserve to have some leniency. Uh, she has the flexibility to do that, but this is just uh, allowing us to be tough with people that we need to be tough with. So, um Jack, um, I, I went through some files I have on this. I had a, I flagged a question when we had our, our pre-meeting from the age because a bunch of the towns that represent adopted this change as well. You're gonna have to, in the motion, I think we should make sure we say what the change to the bylaw is, whether okay. the AG has to approve it. So um, I could help with that, or I'm sure Dave DeLuca can do it. Just make sure and delete okay. you know, whatever, whatever language. It's, it's a great tool. Um, all towns should use this. It just makes sense. Thank you. Any questions, Alright, okay. so late, uh, 8, 9, and 10 are all road acceptances, and I, uh, I, I intend to have some graphics up, you know, just to show the roads uh, when they come in. But it's, it's Keeney Pond, so if you go up through the condominiums at the top of the hill, um, get into um, that those roads up there. Um, this is Castle Road, so it's right at the top of the hill, and then Meeting House Road is actually the, the, the area leading from the condos into that uh, subdivision. And then Wild Holly is uh, one of the uh, cul-de-sacs off of Castle. So those roads have all been completed. They've been brought to standard. The finished coats are on. The PPWs inspected them. They believe they're in, in town quality. Actually, they'd be above town quality at this point. Um, so this is a process that we go through at the end of subdivision uh, development where we accept the roads and uh, the town will then have the responsibility for them in the future. There's no monetary exchange. Uh, some of the language in there about taking funds and eminent domain is, is there for legal purposes if we need to clear a title for some reason, but uh, generally they're just turning those over, those, uh, those deeds and title, you know, ownership of that roads over to us uh, in a very passive manner. Any questions on roads? Hopefully we'll see a lot more in the next uh, few years. Uh, our planner is trying to catch up on some old roads. David, you want to you be my runner and just hand the mic back? Certainly. Thank you, sir. Um, sorry. Thank you. So with the acceptance of the roads, are there any bonds that we're releasing, that the town's releasing? The, through the planning board, they would have they would have re released those before, uh, at the time that the roads are completed. There's a, process that the well, developer goes to the planning board and releases them. Okay, but they were just completed, correct? Like four correct. months ago? Okay, so they'd be, the bonds were released before the, this goes to town meeting? Correct. Okay. And it'd be a planning board process, not a, not a town meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Town clerk position, this is uh, um, an article we've talked about a couple of times, but this is actually sponsored by Carol. Uh, this is a request to make, to convert the clerk's position from an elected position to a, an appointed position. Uh, as you may or may not know, the clerk position is real, is an, that's the only employee that we have in the town who is elected. 
Um, lots of towns, if you look at Franklin and, and other towns, they've converted a lot of their positions, you know, treasurer, or clerk, um, some, place, some places they have an accountant who's an elected. Um, I think, and I'm, I'm sure Jay's probably seen it too, I think the trend is more and more of these positions are becoming more, uh, you know, the clerk is kind of the old homey position. I know people have a lot of, you know, a real warm feeling when they think about the clerk. But I can tell you it's not just the, you know, the uh, motherly person that you might have had in the clerk's office in the old days that just kind of took care of birth certificates and death certificates and that's, you know, it was a pretty slow office. Now I can tell you she's working on computers, she's taking care of census, she's, you know, there's, there's more and more responsibilities in the clerks. So the idea of making a, what we call a professional position, an appointed position, is it allows us that if we have an opening, we can go out and hire somebody from anywhere. It doesn't have to be a, a Norfolk resident. We can go out, we can interview people, we can check their skills, we can look at their resume, and we can hire somebody who's qualified for the position rather than relying upon an elected position, which lots of times turns out to be a, a popularity, you know, obviously it's an election, it's a popularity contest. Um, and you may not be electing somebody who is qualified for the position. Um, so that's the reason uh, Carol brought it forward. I think all the selectmen, I know all the selectmen support it. I support it. Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of conversation about it at town meeting, but that's, that's uh, um, because some people like the tradition of electing. But um, we think it's important to have a, an appointed position. Can you clarify appointed by who? It would, uh, because I'm a town administrator, uh, all the positions in Norfolk are technically appointed by the Board of Selectmen, okay. um, unless under, under some specific statute. Um, I think the process that we're thinking about in this case is, is and, and we do it for a lot of positions, is I go through a process and select somebody, and then, uh, and then go through a confirmation process with the selectmen to, to sign off on that. Same as the police chief, fire chief, finance director. Uh, Basically, all my I have 12, 12 reports. Uh, meeting minutes. This again is so, uh, brought to us by the clerk, and this is trying to uh, just formalize the process to make sure that every board and committee in town is uh, putting their minutes into the town clerk, and, and we're we're you know, we get required to keep minutes. Uh, the best place for for records to be kept is with the clerk, and so we want. Uh, we want to give her a little bit of a stick to go and beat up on some road committees to make sure that minutes are being kept in a secure place. Question about that? Sure. Um, so, so this note, I guess it's, uh, I don't know it's from, says um, that um, uh, this, uh, does not specify how the minutes are recorded. Um, if um, a board or committee decided to make an audio recording of their minutes, would the, that be acceptable? No. Um, and, <laughs> and if the um, board or committee um, never produced the minutes on paper but produced it electronically, would it um, be acceptable to sign it electronically without a, a paper copy? As of right now, it's not acceptable to sign them electronically. Um, they need to actually have them signed at a meeting, have them physically signed. Um, so the board produces the minutes, um, they get them signed when they're accepted, and then they get filed in my office. Um, and then what happens to them from there is they get uh, laser fished, so we have a searchable database because of the new public records law. It makes us also much more efficient and able to handle residents' requests for that because a lot of times we can pull records up in a matter of minutes that before you were like looking for, <laughs> um, and they all get stored in the safe. So that's kind of the process. Once they're laser fished, then they get stored in the safe as permanent record. So I guess my suggestion is that if the um, board committee um, creates the records electronically using you know, Microsoft Word or some other word processing product like that, um, it seems it would be more convenient to go around if they could pass it to the town clerk um, of the electronic release the word processing file and with some some way of certifying that it had been approved by the board. It, it might be more efficient, but as far as open meeting law goes and certification of minutes, that isn't the case as of yet. They need to produce physical minutes and they need to be signed. I, I know that I'm not, I'm not familiar with uh, public records law, so I can't say what's in that, but I am pretty confident that there is no such requirement in the open meeting law that it be on paper or physically signed. 
Okay, I'd have to but, but look at that. But they say that the, the, the minutes then they have to be approved. And yeah, clerks certainly they have to be approved. Okay, we'll work on it. <laughs> yeah. Could, could, can I just say something? Um, so I'm on the Board of Health, and I don't have an email address for the town, a secure email address. So how, I don't know how we would sign it electronically. We sign the minutes at the meeting from the previous. And I, I think that's a good system. Unless we have a secure website that will allow um, danger. So I'm certainly not... Um, desirous of debating it, but it would be possible to have um, uh, a secure electronic signature. Sure. Yeah. I guess all the things but that you're suggesting are a possibility. Um, it's just not the way it's done right now, and maybe it could be looked at for the future, but you know, going forward, we'll keep with signing them and turning them in. Well, we do have, I, mean, I agree, I mean, I think all good ideas, I think, you know, some of the laws have changed in, in Massachusetts. You know, we can have remote participation. You can have you know, somebody phoning in for a meeting. Um, we, we don't allow that in Norfolk because the selectmen haven't accepted that. Uh, that. That would need to be accepted at the selectmen's level. But, uh, so things do progress, uh, uh, but uh, very slowly. Uh, so Article 13 is a petition. Um, I know a bunch of the Energy Committee is here and, and other supporters of this, of this article. Um, Again, I think, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on it. I think if we circle around at the end and people want to talk about the stretch code some more, we can do that. I know you've had some public forums and uh, and, and had some uh, NCTV coverage of this, so I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's up to the town whether or not they're going to support it or not. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just, just a general question mm -hmm. on why this is on the board as opposed to um, on the ballot. Can you explain the difference? Um, uh, Jay, do you want to, I mean, I, it's, that's the... Would this be something that would be on the ballot as opposed to on the town warrant? I think general law requires it to just be a town meeting vote, so I don't... Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it, it, it's just a legislative decision, which is town meeting. There's no requirement that it go to the ballot. So that's just under the law. So the legislative assembly is town meeting, not the ballot. Okay, but this is restrictions imposed on all the residents, correct? So we we impose restrictions on all the residents by bylaws, or you mean just simple votes of various boards all the time? Zoning change, zoning changes, uh, bylaw changes are all Definitely. legislative Thank process. Uh, Article 14 is known, that'll be an interesting debate at town meeting. So because of, well, not because of, but as a follow-up to the statewide vote that happened, uh, which allowing recreational marijuana in Massachusetts, uh, legislature uh, opted to give towns the authority to uh, restrict, ban um, the sale of marijuana, uh, along with uh, all the other related activities, uh, developing it, et cetera. So because Norfolk, uh, in our vote, uh, in the state vote, but Norfolk's portion of that vote, we defeated that question. We have the ability to go with town meeting and add, uh, in this case, a general bylaw. Uh, if this passes, we're gonna go, we're gonna ask for a, a zoning bylaw in the spring um, that's recommended by town council. Um, but we can, we can do that at town meeting. If other towns that supported the sale of marijuana, recreational marijuana, um, if they if they actually supported it, then they would be required to have a ballot question. Um, but we, because we defeated it, uh, we just need to have a town meeting vote. Um, so I think there will be a lot of you know there will be some, there was a lot of debate at the advisory board. I, I assume town meeting is going to have a lot of. Um, vote about this. I know Mr. Lehan has some pretty strong opinions, as, as do I. I. I don't favor, I favor the ban of uh, recreational marijuana. So, um, it doesn't mean you can't, we, we, we can't ban the use of it. Um, that's the one thing we can't do, but we can ban a lot of the retail activity. Article 15 is, uh, yeah, as yeah. just a curiosity question. Yeah. <laughs> 
town level, what was the split during the election on the issue? I can't remember if it was, a, uh, I want to say it was like 55 45, somewhere. We, the marijuana question. Uh, 51 49. Thank you. What was it? 51 49. Okay, 51 49. So it was, it was pretty close. Yeah. And Brenton just passed the bylaw very similar to this liberal, it was 51 49. Sure. And then I'm meeting again, unanimously supported this. Okay. Okay. Basically, it just says that you, you can use it because you have, that's the state law. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to sell it. <laughs> but then there's no tax money coming in. So, and, and, and it's recreational, by the way. It's recreational. Medical is not medicinal. Not medical. So not medical. There's some medical. It's recreational. It's some medical. It's some medical. And there's some marijuana as a pharmacy or something like that. Wait, no. I'm not like sure where the distinction is. Oh, Jake. Well, I mean, Jake would probably. So you, could, you, you could, could, could sell medicinal. Medicinal is only an authorized dispensary, and there are none proposed in town. This time, um, there are some going in in the area of towns that that you'll you'll see popping up. There's already one I think somewhat nearby. Um, just so people know too, this is going to be presented a little bit differently. Normally, the advisory board makes first motions on things. However, because this was the selectmen's initiative and the advisory board is recommending against it, I figure it's only fair that the selectmen get a chance to support something that they put forward rather than put something forward in the negative that may result in if the advisory board so desires to have some kind of substitute motions I will walk everyone through it there could be all kinds of shades of gray on this people have strong feelings about this but it's going to be presented a little bit differently at town meeting than what we normally do it'll still be the, the same rules of procedure but um, it'll be the, the selectmen first at the mic any other questions Pretty well. So Old Town Hall, I, I assume everybody knows where Old Town Hall is down Old Town Hall. Um, it's it's you know we've shut that down, we're not seeing it. The septic system is, is long gone. Um, the recreation uh, committee was recreation department was the last kind of user of that building. Um, and it got to the point where they we needed to get them out of there too. So it's it's at the point where we've we've talked about it many times. We've talked about tearing it down. But there's a um, there are some reasons for zoning uh, and grandfathering that we can't just tear it down if we want to have it, if we want to sell it in the future for, uh, to put a building on. So we're, we're selling it as is. Um, I've got a couple um, pieces here. David, can I borrow the mic? Uh, just very quickly, this, this right below the 100, that's the old town hall. So we're going to carve. We're going to, we're going to carve off this piece right here uh, as a separate lot, and then we, this. So this is what we would sell. Uh, this is uh, one engineer's concept of what what could be done there. Um, you know, either tear down and rebuild, or, or significantly restore that building. Maybe I'll put a parking lot here with the septic system. Um, and for whatever that's worth, this is this is old town hall right here. Uh, so we would keep the old town hall parking lot. We would keep the what we call the water department garage, even though it's fire department vehicles in there. And then we keep this trail that goes out to old town pond. Uh, for those of you who haven't been there, I recommend you at least walk out there sometime. It's a nice little walk. Um, here's a path going all the way there. This is where there's a whole bunch of construction. You know, 106, 108 Main Street. Uh, but so that's really what we're planning to do. Um, what would happen is we would, we would auction off the property um, or use some type of procurement process to, to legally advertise it and sell it off. And then um, that money would come into the general fund. We'd, we'd again come back to town meeting and, and decide what to use, use it, whether it goes into the stabilization fund or we reuse it for a specific purpose that would be um, for town meeting to decide at some point in the future. But uh, we think we can pretty easily get a couple hundred thousand dollars, but we I think maybe even the building commissioner thinks we can possibly up to four hundred thousand. So um, we you know that'll and then it'll be zoned commercial. So it could be a dentist office or, or other offices. So uh, lots of different uses I'm sure. Any questions? Yes ma'am. <laughs> Donna oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Could you go back a slide? 
Uh, what is in the upper right? I see the town seal and then can't read it. Anything that we should know? Um, that's just off of uh, our GIS system. It's a legend that has a like red fire department and stuff. So there's a, just a legend for different types of buildings. It's nothing. There's not like a footnote as to what we want to guard that specific property. Any other questions? Uh, Article 16 is a fun one. It's, uh, so you probably read it in the article, well, and maybe you did the advisory board description. It talks about the, uh, there's a piece of property, a house, a person's house that was built on town property. So this is out uh, on Priscilla. Priscilla. And there's, there's relatively small, by Norfolk standards anyway, relatively small lots. Um, and, I, and again, I'll have a graphic at, at town meeting for this, but uh, there's a there's a lot that we took at some point uh, a long time ago by tax title, so somebody wasn't paying their taxes. We took it um, sometime a period after that, I think in 1997, um, somebody built a house on what they thought was the abutting piece of property. There were some mistakes made by the uh, surveyors and engineers, and the house was built on the, what ended up being the town's property. Um, so in order to we've we've struggled with this for, for a couple of years trying to figure out how to resolve this. Um, we knew that this was, the, this was the, probably the best solution, but we tried to find a quicker method and uh, we were unable to. Um, because if we were kind of, we can't just swap property with them because of the procurement laws. You know, we have to go through a public, anytime we sell off a piece of town property, we have to go through our public bidding process or some type of, and make it fair for everybody. Well, obviously we want to sell it to this one specific person. So this is asking for legislative approval to, to uh, go around the procurement laws. Um, they've agreed to pay us fifty thousand dollars for that um, that strip of land. Um, we think that's a, a fair price uh, based on the. We have really no use for the land, um, but certainly they have a they have, they have a use for it. Um, so we're looking to try and sell them that property. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that one? Do they pay taxes on the whole thing or not? They have they've been paying taxes on the on the vacant piece of property that and, and assessed at uh, their, their they've been paying taxes on their their home. Um, we were we it was in the wrong place, but uh, so they were yes they were paying. Now they'll end up with a bigger piece of property, so they'll be paying more taxes. But but they were paying on one lot and one house, even though they weren't connected. Okay. A question. Um, so assuming that that um, uh, passes at the time meeting. What are the next steps that have to happen in order to complete the process? Uh, the, the very high level steps are just it goes to the legislature. The legislature ends up having a, a vote on it, uh, makes it a bill, and then gets signed by the governor, comes law. Um, then it comes back to the selectmen to, to actually execute the transaction. Thank you. Should be quick. It's gone through House, the legislature's council as well. Uh, they, they've reviewed this. So, it, you know, at least from a technical point of view, you should go through the legislature rather, rather quickly. Um, Article 17, and again, uh, I should have a, I will have a graphic for this one, but if you, um, so if you can envision the, if you're looking at town hall, the left-hand driveway where the mailboxes are, right, everybody know what I'm talking about? Um, there's gonna be a, they're putting a, building a building on the lot next to it, which is right on the cul-de-sac. Um, it's actually going to be the credit union and some uh, apartments above it. What the developer uh, developer went to the planning board and was working with our actually our former town planner um, was working on a potential plan. And what their what they came what the developer came up with and was proposing was having a, a driveway come out, you know, probably 20 or 30 20 to 30 feet away from our driveway. So it would be our driveway, then there would be their driveway, and then be the roundabout. Um, what our planner, Ray Goff, proposed was to combine those two driveways, um, have the developer do all the work so that their parking lot comes out to, a, you know, connects somehow, um, and again, I can show you the, the concept they came up with, and so that there's one driveway that comes out to Liberty Lane. It's just for a traffic flow purpose. Um, you'd rather not have two driveways side by side, Plus, you have the library parking lot across from it, so there's a lot of obviously and then people coming from the roundabout. So this will actually move the driveway a little bit away from the roundabout as well, 
So we just think it's a better solution. Um, I'll tell you there'll probably be some debate. Some people think we're giving something away to a developer. I, I strongly disagree with that concept. I think we're just trying to make a better traffic flow that's, that's good for everybody. And the developer will, be, will bear the cost of, of all the work there. Aren't the mailboxes right at the end of that street? Yeah. I'm just so like, are they gonna like? I might move those right so the people who are stopping to drop off their letters aren't. Yeah. Okay. That's a good idea. We can certainly move the uh, mailboxes okay. up closer to town hall. Yeah. So that, uh, I'm just feeling that people stopping and then deleting yeah. traffic. It's a good good suggestion. So then, going forward, who's responsible for updating of that um, piece of property for snow removal, for resealing, and? Just, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll, I can't answer that. I, I, love to, I want to have the drawing in front of me because I, 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 you know, I think obviously we'll just plow out our driveway the same way we would have used to. We, we won't go into his driveway. I'm sure they'll probably do the same thing. When the, when the two come up to a T, you know, that one spot will actually get plowed by both entities. Um, you know, as far as we'll have to have some cost sharing for be paid at some point in the future, but you know, that's a that's probably a fairly minor cost in the big scheme of things. So it's not a big pile no. of land. It's oh no, we're just talking about uh, probably 25 feet of, a, of where the two driveways will connect and then come out to the lane together. So it's not, it's not a big. Jack, this is my There have been there have been people that have suggested that we're doing this to advantage of Elmer Jack mentioned this. I just want to restate this. That is absolutely not the case. Uh, he doesn't care. He, he, he submitted a plan with a separate driver, and he's indifferent to this. This idea came from our plan. This was in our initiative because, as Jack said, it, it's, to us, it makes a lot of sense because it makes it much easier from a public safety perspective. We have like, two separate driveways with two separate cars coming out at the same time. This was not driven by the developer. This was entirely driven by the developer. Any other questions? Thank you, David. Just to follow up on your point about the plowing and maintenance, because there are apartments that, um, you know, plowing the driveway, consideration has to be made then as to the parking area, because the, ten the tenants would have to get out, be able to get out of the parking lot to get to the road to get out. Um, so it's a slippery slope you might be um, going down if an agreement's not reached with the developer as to how that Plowing and maintenance to be taken care of going forward. I agree. I think if I can show you, I can only show you a Google map of what it is today, but I can kind of describe what we're talking about. No, Larry had a question too. If you want to ask your question, no, I, I, I wanted to uh, explore the circle back uh, uh, process that you suggested we might do okay. after you ran through the 17 uh, articles. Driveway that's there today. Obviously, there's the mailboxes we talked about. This is where the, the bank and, and apartments above will be, and then there will be parking in this section here. So, what we're just talking about is having instead of them exiting out right here, we're going to have a connection right here, and then you know, combine this so that they're all going out at one spot. Um, and it, it might, I can show you the, the plan that's been submitted. Um, to the planning board of, of having that up at town meeting, you know, it'll make more sense. We're only talking about, you know, so it'll be, it'll, it won't be where the parking area is that is combined with the town. It, it'll only be that they'll exit out, you know, they're going to basically exit out onto this and then they're all going to come up um, at that entrance. So, does, does that mean they're going to enter from the other one, Jack? There's going to be a, well, they may be a, this, this, that's a good question. It's only, you know, it's only wide enough for one way there. Um, and I've been, I've been told by the police department that is actually a two-way road, just so you know. But, but we will, we'll make sure that that's safely done, yes. 
bottle of shit and I've seen him drive the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. And he drives you. Just how many clock ways are running? What's that? Back. Who's your back? <laughs> there will be an entrance over here on Union Street as well. Uh, so not all the traffic from, and there's, I think we're talking about four apartments, so it's not like, you know, a big, huge complex. It's not a 40 meter. It's not a 40 meter, no. <laughs> Excellent question. All right, I think we're ready to start circling around. It's hilarious. Okay, great. Uh, two things, okay? Uh, when we, when the streets have been, started talking about the stretch road, trying to figure out uh, like what it all meant. Uh, it made sense to us to put together something that we could hand out to people. So we put together a frequently asked questions on one piece of paper for everybody to see and to, to digest it as they might. Like. Just the ladies over there, if you would. Anybody that's interested can pick up a copy or as many as you want. And we'll be handing those out uh, at the train station on uh, Monday and Tuesday prior to the town meeting. The second thing is, it's not about the stretch code. The stretch code is a stepping stone. It's a prerequisite to becoming a green community. We have left hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table because we are not a recognized green community. The, the stretch code is the fifth and last criteria that we have to satisfy in order for the DOER to consider us a green community and to designate Norfolk as a green community. And if we can get to that point, there's no limit to what we can do. We can get up to $250,000 a year for project grants from DOER for energy efficiency projects that we could come up with. The designation grant, which DOER would award to Norfolk, if and when we become a green community, is $140,000. So the day that they decide that we're a green community and we've satisfied the criteria, we get a check for $140,000. And then we can get up to $250,000 for projects that we uh, propose to the OER in, uh, in the future, following that, uh, that, initi that uh, initiation. So it's, it's don't, I, I just don't want people to get hung up on it's the stretch code. The stretch code is a stepping stone. It's all it is. It's a prerequisite to becoming a green community. And a green community is important because it, there's a whole load of money out there waiting for the town to qualify for. Thank you. Um, just can you clarify to me? I was doing some research online on it. And I was just talking to this um, woman here before she left. Is is the requirements only applicable to new construction, or is it renovations and new construction? Only new construction. Okay. Because online I saw it, it applied yeah. to renovations they as well. They changed the, the uh, stretch code in 2017, January. But that doesn't mean that they can't change it in the future to include any renovations that you do as well. well we have the option to to um, get out of the program in, in the future and to, to underdog, if you will, the stretch code. There's, there's always that, that opportunity available. If, um, if the state does something to change the stretch code in a way that, that we as a community believe is, is detrimental to the, to, to the, uh, to the town, then we can, we can vote at town meeting to uh, underdog in terms of, you said that if they're designated, if we're designated the, by adopting the stretch code, a green community, we get the hundred and forty thousand yeah. dollars. When they designate, is that money? Um, is there a plan to use that money for some sort of green initiative? And if so, does the plan need to be submitted back to the state and approved to the state in order to receive the funds? Okay. The way that it works is. The way that it works is um, when, when we are designated by the green community, we get a check for $140,000. Typically, what that means is that seed money for us to put together the, the project grant applications for the subsequent year. Okay. Thank you. So, can you just clarify? If you put an addition on your home, does the addition no. have to meet the stretch code? No. No, it's only 
is only for new residential construction and new commercial construction when that commercial construction is either over 100,000 square feet or is greater than 40,000 square feet and is a high energy consumer. That is to say, if it's a refrigerated warehouse or if it's a supermarket, then it would fall under the stretch rule. But again, it's only new construction. Somebody, I only recently learned that somebody said that 40 Bs are, are they are exempt. They are. No, they're not exempt. They, they, they would, the stretch code would apply to them because they're residential units. That's the, that, that's the, the way it's been described to me by DOER. It's, it's, it's the key is on the residential aspect of the property. Okay, that's good. I, that, that was going to really bother me. Exempt 40 Bs. Oh, sorry. Jack, just a quick question. Have you, um, I know this is a little bit new with the stretch code, but have you had a chance to talk to any businesses um, that may be interested in coming to door for if we adopt the stretch code, if that's something because of the higher requirements for building that would preclude them choosing door fork as a place to construct and conduct business? Because we do need a commercial base. You know, we need to increase our commercial base. Here in North York, and this is something that's detrimental to us um, if we're trying to increase our commercial base. And I, I, I have not. I personally have not. I think our planner probably has had uh, um, both Ray and, and now Richard. Um, you know, I think that kind of related to that. You know, one of my concerns is that you know not all towns around us have adopted the stretch code, so it does put us at a competitive. But some have, I mean. Some have. Right, so yeah. it's not. So, right. yeah, no, it's not. What if you don't have No, 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 we're not, we're not, we wouldn't be, we certainly would not be singling ourselves out. I think, like you said, 185 communities have. Um, um, I know Rentham hasn't, Foxborough hasn't, I think Plainville has. Well, frankly, just, they're just uh, dropping the stretch. Yeah, so, you know, it doesn't just apply to commercial, it applies to residential as well, whether or not, yeah. you know, there's uh, a competitive, Advantage, and some people would look at the stretch code being an advantage. You know that they're going to get a more fuel efficient house, more fuel efficient uh, commercial structure. So you know it might be they they know that the, the building has to be built to a higher um, level. You know, higher people could speed. choose to you know at a new construction, people could choose to have the builder use the higher grade, uh, the higher efficiency, um, as opposed to it being mandated. Yeah. That's, it's, it's a choice. I would agree. I'd like to make a general comment not related to any uh, article in particular, and that's I found this meeting uh, quite useful, and I'd like to thank everybody. I, I, I don't mean to, to sound like I want to end anything, but I'd like to thank all the um, town officials, whether uh, employees or uh, uh, volunteers, whether appointed or elected, uh, and um, everybody who's here, I think this is useful and I appreciate the uh, participation of everybody. Well, thank you. Uh, and, uh, it's been, been good. I actually did this a long time ago and got away from it, so it's good to get back in the swing of things. Um, yeah, I don't want to keep anybody who wants to get going from going. I, well, that, you remind me of one thing, I don't know why, but uh, that uh, course, the question about the appointed versus elected, that still does have to go to the ballot. So if it is approved at town meeting, it still has to go through the ballot in the spring. And that's why we actually wanted to do it in the fall so that we can then go to the springtime meeting. If we did it at the springtime meeting, that would be after the, the election. So we'd have to wait another whole year. Um, so we generally prefer to have big things like that discussed at the annual town meeting, but because of time, it makes more sense to do it here. And, and the whole town will get a crack at it uh, one way or another at the ballot question. Is that the only article that then goes to the ballot? Yes. Okay. So, so we'll on that issue. <laughs> um, from some of the comments on Facebook, could you cover the process of what goes through putting something on the warrant and when the general citizens get to see it? Sure. The, uh, the warrant gets opened uh, probably three to four months ahead of town meeting. Uh, we select and vote to open the warrant. Uh, we then go through a process of about uh, six weeks of uh, collecting articles. Uh, generally, they come in on the last day. And uh, uh, then at the next selectman's meeting, they vote to close the warrant. Um, it's, 
uh, still at a point where we are uh, um, sometimes wordsmithing articles at that point, uh, especially with town council. Um, I recently learned from my esteemed moderator that uh, petition articles can be submitted all the way up until the point that the, the warrant is actually posted. Um, so so uh, you need 100 signatures for a warrant article for a special town meeting, 10 signatures at the annual town meeting. So it's a much lower threshold at town meeting for some reason. That's a state law. Uh, <coughs> so the because I've watched most meetings on NCTV, I know that the selectmen thoroughly review it, and then it gets to the advisory board, and people pose the articles, have to support it yeah, I to the advisory board, and then it gets printed, and then the citizen goes, oh, I didn't know there was a meeting. No, I, you know, and, and Carol and uh, actually her predecessor brought a system into the town, uh, it's the town calendar, uh, that's a fancier name. My Town Government uh, on, on the website. And I know we're transitioning. We have both websites going right now, but uh, you can get to it from either one. My Town Government, you go there and you can you can sign up for to be pummeled with more email to get uh, notices of, uh, you can pick a committee. So in this case, I, I would pick the advisory committee and the, uh, and the selectmen. And every time they, they post a meeting, you'll get an email saying what the agenda is going to be. Um, but I, Back to your point, I encourage people to, to use that so that you can attend. If you're interested in town meeting and kind of knowing what's going on, attend either of the selections meeting where we generally talk. We'll talk about the budget in February, March, and April. Um, and at the same point, attend the <coughs> meetings where they'll debate the pros and cons of all these articles uh, during their process, which uh, generally is in the spring, probably about three months uh, leading up to town meeting. Thank you. Well, did you turn off the Norfolk Community Day? No, it's where I've seen the comments. Okay. Yeah. Which is not an official town manager. <laughs> not at all. Very So I'm just curious about the communication because um, we did, we've been away for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or something. And we came home today and there was a postcard saying that town meeting was in December 5th. Yep. But, um, Aren't there other ways to communicate to people, um, even like, that the other town meeting, the one that was supposed to be in twice already, you know, till November? Well, right. November 14th. It was November 14th, we had to move it. Right. And um, couldn't there be something located in town that would tell tell us that as well, that town meeting is going to be the state? And also, um, and I'm not quite sure how this system works, but the... Um, Telephone, robo telephone call. Yep. Uh, could you not use that to tell people, or is that only for emergencies? We we definitely try to use it because we got in. You know, we definitely try to use that just for emergencies. Um, uh, we are actually planning on planning to do that probably Friday to send out a reverse call, a reverse nine one one message to everybody. That, you know, hopefully they get the postcard. But if they if they can, you know, go to the website or come down to four or five different locations around town to pick up a warrant if they want. Um, generally, you know, historically we've mailed out the warrant, uh, but uh, because this is a relatively small town meeting, we can tell uh, traditionally a fall town meeting, we only get about 80 people. I think I think with the stretch code, we'll probably get more than that at this meeting, but uh, it seemed like a very big expense to print out 3,500 warrants and mail them all out. Um, not only that, it's time consuming, um, so we, we went with that. The electronic format this year. Did you mean instead so, of the postcards? Were you no, saying I'm just in addition. In addition to. I think at the spring town meeting we'll still mail out the warrant. But the reverse nine one one. Do you have to sign up for that? Or no. Is that everybody? It picks up. It picks up the white pages. If you will, the old traditional. It picks up the white pages automatically. You can sign up and add your cell phone to that if you want, or or add you know for some reason. A cell know, phone. If you have an unlisted number, you'd have, you'd have to sign up. Or if you want for a cell phone. You can add your cell phone. Yeah, you can either you can call my office and we'll add it for you, or there is a connection on the website to, to add it. Thank you. I can tell you, friend. I've used it for um, elections to just remind people to have elections because of such low turnout, and I get I get every bit as many complaints about using it <laughs> as if we do. Then people are really happy about it. People don't feel that it's a good use of a you know a reverse emergency system. So that's a, that was a double-edged sword. 
Any other questions about any article? Yeah. So, Jack, this is a plea for transparency. Um, I know that under the open meeting law, meetings are open, except for sessions. Um, but a lot of people can't attend open meetings. There's a lot going on, often multiple meetings simultaneously, and there isn't a way of being, all, being in a of them. Um, and I know from past years, at least, there's been um, a sort of packet of, of correspondence, correspondent associated with each of Warren article, where you know, there's, the article is proposed, there's you know, discussions between the town administrator and the proposers, or the advisory committee, or the uh, town council, and um, uh, in the past you've been willing to share that on paper. Um, at uh, least occasionally. Well, you, you just talking like my little boxes in the bottom yeah. of the warrant. Yeah, I mean, I, so the updated warrant, you, I'm sure, right. David, because you're an early adopter, you've got the early version. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I updated it Monday afternoon, it has my little boxes on there that has little descriptions. Um, but but, but I, I guess I'm asking for more than that. I'm asking for um, the email exchanges that have gone back and forth about each warrant article. Um, and I know that, um, you know, there's an argument in favor of transparency, and the argument there's an argument against it. And you know, I, I won't go through either argument, but um, I'm saying um, rather, you know, I wouldn't force this on anybody, but it would be very nice if um, that collection of information were made available on the website so that people who wanted to see the discussion that had happened uh, about our articles could, in fact, see who was saying what and how they supported their positions. Yeah, I don't recall. I mean, I don't remember doing that in the past. I may have, and I'm getting older. I'm forgetful. But uh, um, I, I, I guess I'm not eager to, you know, start posting all my emails out on, you know, they're public records, so people can ask for them. But uh, um, certainly with town council, there's probably a lot of legal advice that I, I'd have to, you know, due diligence. I think sue the question. David, if you if you want. If you want to see all of the back and forth, it's not done by email. It's it's done in the meetings. I mean, it has to be it has to be posted. It's voted. So you can request the minutes of both the advisory board and the board of selectmen's office. Um, but there's there's no discussion back and forth on on. I mean, Brian is a member of the advisory committee here tonight. It's all done in the meeting. So I think your, the minutes would be your best. So, so people have been very forthcoming and sharing things in the past, which I certainly appreciate. Um, I remember, and, and you know that you know, I've been asking for early drafts of the warrant, um, and there was a time, I don't know, three or four years ago, where um, somebody shared with me a draft of the warrant that had uh, multiple pages of discussion about each of the warrant articles. Um, you know, while they were thinking about it and you know, going back and forth and I'm saying I'm not I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay, well, yeah you great show it to me. I kind of I don't remember doing that either, but i we probably did, but uh, maybe not intentionally. Um, <laughs> any other any other questions? I thank you all very much for coming tonight. It's uh, thank you. it was a good discussion. Thank you. I look forward to doing it in the spring.